Well, um, today we're continuing on our Route 66, our journey through the Bible overview. And so you'll want your Bibles open to Ruth tonight. And uh, because it's a shorter book, we'll actually be able to get into a little bit more of the text than what we have in the past, which will be good. Uh, but Ruth tonight, uh, you'll miss it if you go too fast from Judges to 1 Samuel. It's right there in between. And so uh, as you turn there, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. I thank you for this book of Ruth, especially as it comes after the book of Judges. Lord, there's so much sadness as Judges end, but there's so much hope and the redemption that you show in the book of Ruth. And Lord, we pray that you would help us see the redemption that we have in Christ, the love that you have for us, and um, Lord, the commitment um, that we can have as well. Lord, we're so grateful. Teach us tonight by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, tell me if you've heard the, the plot line before. Boy meets girl. Boy loses girl. Boy wins the girl again, right? That's 90% of the chick flicks out there, right? It's a, the classic love story. The book of Ruth is also a love story, but it's a bit less conventional. Let me give you a bit of that plot line, at least just at the beginning. Boy meets girl. Boy and all his family die. Girl is left destitute with her mother-in-law. And uh, things go on from there. Not exactly you'd find on a 30-minute sitcom TV show these days. It starts with tragic beginnings, but the book of Ruth goes on to tell one of the greatest stories of love and devotion. I think that's recorded really in all history, not just the Bible. We do think of Ruth as a love story, and it is, uh, but it's actually two love stories. There is the relationship between Ruth and her future husband, Boaz, but there's also the relationship between Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. And it's not really the romantic love, but it's a sacrificial love that shines through in really all of those relationships. Ruth is willing to lay everything aside for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Boaz is willing to lay everything aside, extend mercy and grace to Ruth. Both Ruaz, both Ruaz Boaz and Ruth, you know, it's kind of like what they had with, uh, what was it, J-Lo and Ben Affleck or whomever they were together. They combined the names. Ruaz, we'll just go with that. Uh, Boaz and Ruth. You know, they show the extent to which they're going to give of themselves to protect another. So great examples for us, of course, but they also wonderfully foreshadow the full sacrificial love of Jesus for us because no one gave more for our protection, no one gave more for our provision than Jesus. He gave His very life, of course, at the cross so we could be forgiven and live eternally with God. Now, that said, I do want to emphasize something just from the beginning. This is not even though there's a lot of scriptural parallels. This is not a fictional account. This is not a parable. This is not an allegory to try to teach us spiritual truths about Jesus. We'll see a lot of spiritual truths here. We'll see a lot of illustrations here, a lot of foreshadowing here, but this is a historical account about real people. These people really did suffer, and they really did both demonstrate and experience the redemptive grace of God. And that's really one of the most beautiful aspects about it, I believe, because if they can demonstrate the true sacrificial love of God for each other during their worst times, surely we can do the same thing during our times as well. Um, now, like many other biblical books, Ruth is technically anonymous. It never mentions its author, nor does it really give an exact timing for its setting and writing. It does give us some general information. We'll look at that, enough to get the background of the book. We're specifically told the setting takes place during the time of the judges, but we're not told during which judge. Uh, the writing of the book, though, almost certainly took place during the monarchy. The final few verses of the book really demonstrate the reason that it was written in the first place. It was written to chronicle the family tree of David. And so you know that it had to be written during the monarchy for that to be mentioned there. If you go backwards via the generations that are listed in David's genealogy, then it's possible that the events of, the Ruth, events of Ruth take place during the 12th century B.C., which places you right around the time of Gideon, maybe Jephthah, and the time of the judges. Obviously, those judges had little to no impact on the, the story. The events taking place with Gideon were much farther to the north, uh, closer to Galilee than it was in Bethlehem and Judah. But whoever the judge was at the time, we don't know um, who exactly during the monarchy wrote it. We don't know either. Uh, tradition ascribes it to Samuel, 
Some imply that he could not have done it because of its direct mention of David, though I don't really believe that's too much of a problem. You recall Samuel himself anointed David to be the next king of Israel, and even if he didn't live to see David ascend to the throne, he certainly knew what God's plan was concerning him, so it's no problem for him to have written it. The argument against Samuel is basically because David's mentioned there is so prominent means that he was well known among Israel. But again, David was a national hero before he was a king, so that's not really a problem. But it doesn't really matter. The author could have been Samuel, it could have been Nathan, it could have been somebody we've never heard of. We don't know. It's named for Ruth, one of the main characters, one of only two books in our Bible that it's named for a woman. Esther being the other. Now, what makes this particularly interesting is that in Ruth's case, she was not born a Hebrew. Uh, She's a Moabite who converted to the faith of the Hebrews. Now, the Moabites were often on enemies of Israel. In fact, if you recall, when we were looking at the book of Judges, one of the early judges, Ehud, actually delivered Israel out of the hand of the Moabites. They were fighting off and on. They did share a family history with Israel. The nation of Moab is one of two nations descended from Lot. You remember Lot was the nephew of Abraham. And Lot and his two daughters had escaped the destruction of Sodom uh, because the angel of God, of course, delivered them out of that. And They feared to enter into another city that they were told to go to because they were fearing that city might be destroyed. So Lot and his daughters took refuge in the mountains. His daughters panicked thinking that you know, they'd never see civilization again. How are they going to raise up children? So they tricked their father into getting drunk so that he would impregnate them and their lineage could live on. Thus you have Moab born and ben Ami born, from whom came the Moabites and the Ammonites. You read all about it in Genesis 19. Very sordid story, right? But it's out of that history that Ruth emerges. So when we think of Ruth, we don't think of another biblical author like Paul, who's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. We don't think of somebody who's got a strong tie to the patriarchs, distinguishing Jewish features. We think of a Gentile, and not just any Gentile, but a Gentile from a nation born out of incest, right? What kind of background is that? What can God do with someone like that? Well, apparently God can do quite a lot. God uses people from the most unlikely of backgrounds to highlight his mercy and his salvation. And it is interesting that out of all the women listed in Jesus' personal genealogy, and there are several, virtually every single one of them had some sort of question or scandal in their life, seedy background. Tamar had to sleep with her father-in-law to get pregnant. Matthew 1-3 lists Tamar. Rahab was a Gentile prostitute who came to faith. She's listed in Matthew 1, 5. Ruth, of course, a Moabitess and, and on. Bathsheba is mentioned only by inference. But even Mary was caught up in scandal simply by virtue of the virgin birth. That's all part of it. It doesn't matter what our backgrounds are. It doesn't matter what other people think about us or think about what our backgrounds might be. Technically, it doesn't even matter what we think of ourselves. God can do amazing things and seemingly impossible circumstances, and he does these things to highlight his grace, which is exactly what we see here in the book of Ruth. Now, one of the most amazing things that's ever accomplished by the Lord is that of redemption, and that is the undergirding theme throughout the entire book of Ruth. Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, find themselves in the position of needing to be redeemed, and God raises up a redeemer on their behalf. The Hebrew word is ga'al, And that, in various forms, is found, depending on who's counting, 22 to 23 times throughout the book. It's the theme in Ruth. It refers to restoration, refers to reclaiming something. In the specific context of the story, it refers to the restoration of inheritance. It's based directly out of the Law of Moses. And we need to understand this to have the context to know what this book is really all about. We might recall this from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. The husband's brother shall go into her, take her as a wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son in which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that the name may not be blotted out of Israel. Now that sounds pretty disgusting to our ears, We would not wish that in our own families today, but in the time and the culture, it was very acceptable. In fact, it was a merciful outreach of God to provide not only for the widow, but to provide for the family that would have gone on. This right here is the law of leveret marriage. 
we need to remember that the land of Israel itself was a gift of God to the various tribes of Israel. And it had been portioned very carefully out among the people. If you recall through the book of Joshua, a huge part of the book of Joshua went into great detail to show who inherited what. And that land was supposed to be passed down through the generations from father to son to son to son. People of God would live on in perpetual glory to God. So what happened then when the son died and the father had no one to pass it to? Would it go fallow? Would the land be taken over by foreigners? Would the name and the lineage of the father itself perish? Well, leveret marriage is the safeguard against this. In the worst case scenario, when all hope seems lost, the brother or the close relative is supposed to come in, marry the widow, raise up children for the dead brother. So his name lives on. The land stays as the inheritance of Israel. At least that's what was supposed to happen. Not everybody followed the law, of course. This was the time of the judges. Not everybody was willing to sacrifice for his brother, and we're going to see that later on in chapter 4. But that's redemption. Now, this same idea of redemption carries over to the New Testament. Because in our sin, we are what? We're dead. We're the ones who are lost. We're hopeless. And unless someone comes in to restore us, someone comes in to reclaim us for God, then we face an eternity of death and suffering. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he died on the cross for our sin and rose again from the dead. And that's why Peter writes, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you are not redeemed, not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received from tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That was the price Jesus paid for our redemption, for our restoration, for our reclaiming. Jesus paid an immense price for us. He didn't give a payment of gold or silver for a title deed of real estate. He shed his own blood so the price of our sin could be paid. Jesus is the redemption for all who have placed their faith in him. Without Jesus, we're lost. With Jesus, we are redeemed. Now, that's what the book of Ruth shows the Christian today. It highlights the sacrificial love of Christ for us as he gave himself to be our redeemer. It is a love story. And it's the greatest love of all because it's between Jesus and the church. Now, this is going to be the shortest book that we've encountered so far in the Old Testament. There's only four chapters here. The plot really divides very easily among those chapters, those traditional chapters divisions. And we'll be seeing this as we go through the book. We have hope is lost in chapter one. It really sets the scene for us. It goes on from there to see in chapter two, hope is going to be restored. There's a gleam in the distance. They can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see redemption promised in chapter 3. Things are set up, getting ready to go. And then finally, redemption is going to be accomplished in chapter 4. The fall and the rise of hope is seen through the promise and fulfillment of redemption. Of course, that's no less true with the characters of Ruth as it is with us. Our grand hope is in our grand Redeemer. Right, there's no better person on which it can be based. So let's get into some of the, the text here. Hope is lost in chapter 1, and it begins with the setting in verses 1 through 5. And it begins like the ending of a classic Shakespeare play. Everybody dies. Right? Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. First off, there was hopelessness, hopelessness in the nation. And this is seen in two ways. And if you look at verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Hopelessness in the nation. First, the judges were ruling. That was a pretty bad thing. Remember, these were the dark ages in the history of Israel. In fact, if you look up or turn the page, depending on how it goes, just one verse, Judges 21, 25, closed out the book of Judges with this summary statement saying that there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The law of God was being actively ignored. The people of God were living as pagans. The moral and the civil state of society could hardly have been worse. And even if the events of Ruth were concurrent with that of you know, Gideon or some others that were judged was actually trying to lead rightly. Well, we need to remember that the, excuse me, the Hebrews of Gideon's day were anything but faithful to God. When Gideon was first called by God, his, his very first act was to tear down a pagan altar that was erected in the middle of the town square, which almost began a riot. Judges chapter 6 told us that. People were more willing to take a stand for the pagan idol than they were to stand for the living God who had delivered them out of Egypt and given them the land in which they currently lived. 
That was a pretty sad state of the affairs for the people. So even with the judge ruling somewhere in Israel, things were pretty lawless. That was hopeless first. Second, there was a famine in the land. Saw that in verse 1 as well. Obviously, there are many famines throughout the history of Israel, but we need to remember the times in which ancient Israel lived. God had promised them that if they lived according to His covenant, that the land would always be fruitful. Deuteronomy 28, verse 4. The famines would only come if they were unfaithful to the covenant, if they were disobedient. Deuteronomy 28, 18. So what does that tell us? It tells us if there was a famine in Israel, it's because the people were being faithless. The people were being disobedient. The nation was overridden with sin. So there's hopelessness in the nation. There was also hopelessness in the family. Now, look what happened in verse 2. This man from Bethlehem. He leaves his inheritance... The one that had been given him by God is a perpetual inheritance for his family. He leaves that, abandons it to go dwell in Moab. Got a little map here for you where you can see he didn't travel far. He goes from Bethlehem, probably up to Judah or Jerusalem, across the Jordan River and goes south from Ammon all the way into Moab. Wouldn't have taken him too long to get there, but he's leaving everything that God gave him. Remember, the land of Israel, this is the land of milk and honey. This is the land that was so abundant, uh, they were excited to go there. The Hebrews would uh, supposed to forever remember how God had given this land to them as a gift, and that inheritance is supposed to be going on throughout the generations. But now things are so bad to the sin of the people, this man is willing to abandon his inheritance from God, his gift from God, and go live among the pagans. That's a guy who's lost all hope. It's no small irony that the town Bethlehem translates into house of bread. And the famine's so bad that he has to leave the house of bread to go live among the pagans, hopefully to eke out something. What do you do when you lose all hope? Now, sooner or later, we're all going to find ourselves in a situation that's so tragic that we don't know quite what to do. How do you hold on? Do you even try to hold on? For a lot of people, it feels like you know the ship being tossed at sea. I was watching the news and a uh, story the other day about a uh, little ship that out on the Pacific Ocean, they had to get rescued because it was being tossed to and fro. Nothing to hold on to. Nothing anchoring them to any foundation. We need to be solidly anchored. That's what we have in the Lord Jesus. And remember how he ended teaching Sermon on the Mount? So the winds and the storms could blow, but if you hear his words and put them into practice, we're anchored upon the rock. He is our anchor. He's a solid rock upon which we can stand. Elimelech didn't have that. And he abandons it. He leaves it all behind. Now, we do want to pay a little attention to the names as we go through Ruth because they seem to have special importance. And again, this isn't a parable. It's not an allegory, but God does use the names of some of these historical people to highlight some of their role. Elimelech means God of the king. And when you think about what this guy did, this is purely ironic because Elimelech He's a true Hebrew who should have been worshiping and fearing God, but his actions actually indicate the opposite. Granted, we don't know his heart. We don't know what he did when he got to Moab, but the Bible doesn't really say much about him at all. But he does not seem to be trusting in the true God of Israel because he's fleeing Israel. He's abandoning the promises of God. Who's his wife? Well, his wife is Naomi, it says. Her name means pleasant. And this is going to come up later on in chapter 1 as a specific play on words. Naomi is very much aware of the meaning of her name, and once tragedy befalls her, she feels like life is anything but pleasant. Their son's name, as you can see there, uh, Malon, Chilion. Malon means sick. Chilion means consumption or failing. Seems like terrible names to give your children. <laughs> Victory, right? That's what we want. Grace, that's what we want to name. No, failing, consumption, destruction. Now, it seems like these names may have been chosen by the author as a bit of foreshadowing rather than being their historical names. But whatever the case, their names are certainly fitting to what takes place. Later on, we're going to read and find that they marry Orpah. Her name means mane or neck, stiff-necked. Now, how this relates to the daughter-in-law, we, we don't really know. It may be a reference to a bit of stubbornness on her part. Don't really know. Just a little bit of trivia, by the way. This was supposed to be Oprah's name, Oprah Winfrey. They just uh, mispronounced it. So there you go. You can remember Orpah now the rest of your life. Ruth, 
Ruth means friend. Now, that's a name that truly befits the historical Ruth very well. She was a friend to Naomi when all other friends had abandoned her. Now, the problem, of course, is that all the men die. Elimelech had taken his family to Moab for survival, and it didn't work out very well. They experienced the opposite. First, Elimelech dies, and instead of returning to Bethlehem at that time, his sons and their mother stay in Moab for another 10 years. They've married now uh, two Moabite women, and they had completely settled there in Moab by the time they died and left all three women childless widows. So that's how it all begins, just really cheery. And it goes on to talking about the survivors, starting in verse 6 through 18. Things are pretty bad for the women. Naomi hears that the famine is over back home, so she's making preparations to leave. She tells her two daughters-in-law to go home to their families. No way, of course, for Naomi to provide uh, any provision for her daughters-in-law. You know, it, it would be a, another son from her womb that would provide a lever at marriage. There'd be at least a generation's gap between them. She's too old to bear children. She doesn't see any other option. Really difficult to fault Naomi in any of this. After all, what else could she do? She could either starve among the people of Moab, back home to Israel, perhaps starve there. At least in Israel, she'd have access to the benevolence and the law of Moses as long as people were obeying the law of Moses. You know, she may have lost hope, but she seems like even in her worst time, never truly abandons all faith in God, which speaks highly of her, I believe. Out of the two daughters-in-law, you've got two responses. Now, they both initially refuse to go. They both weep with her, but it didn't stay that way. Orpah does leave Naomi. She goes back home to her family, presumably. But Ruth remained. And no matter what Naomi said to her, Ruth refused to leave her side, and she speaks some of the deepest words of personal commitment that are found in the pages of Scripture. Look, if you would, to Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 and 17. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you from me. Isn't that awesome? And these words are often quoted in wedding ceremonies, but notice this isn't the love between a husband and wife, between a daughter and her mother-in-law. I don't know what relationship you've got with your mother-in-law. This is amazing, right? Whatever the relationship was between Ruth and Naomi, it was deep. And Ruth couldn't bear to be parted from her. She's willing to give up her home, her security, her background, even her religion to be with Naomi. And she's already expressed faith in the one true God as she's committed herself to Naomi for all her life. Now, it may not have been spoken between a, a husband and wife, but it sure is a good measure of commitment between a husband and wife. Husband and wife is supposed to be two becoming one flesh. That's far more than a statement of physical intimacy. It's something that takes place on a spiritual level. They become one person, fully committed to one another for life. And when that sort of commitment is made with the Lord at its center, it's a beautiful thing. And it's described very much in these terms. Notice one more thing here that Ruth does in regards to her faith. She burns her bridges to the past. By committing herself to Naomi, specifically to Naomi's God, the God of Israel, she cuts herself completely off from any sort of pagan religion she may have had part of in the past. Moabites worship Chamath, which was an idol such as Baal, the same sort of fertility god that was out there. She was probably raised in that. Well, she cuts herself completely off with that, and she's committed to the God of Israel, burning all of these bridges. She places herself under the hand of the discipline of Almighty God. May the Lord, notice the capital L-O-R-D there, she's using the covenant name of God. May Yahweh do this to me and also if I turn back. Just something that wasn't going to happen. When we come to faith in Christ, it's a full 100% commitment to follow Christ as our Lord. That's not trying to keep the door cracked open to something else. Jesus said that we can't serve two masters. It's impossible to do so. We're either going to love one, hate the other. But that's so what so many people try to do. They try to serve two masters. They try to walk both sides of the fence. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Get on one side, get on the other. Burn your bridges to the past. Make a full commitment to the Lord Jesus and follow him alone. Moving on through chapter 1, it moves from there to the sadness Upon their return, the two women get back to Israel, and after a, a decade has passed now, the people of Bethlehem do recognize Naomi, but they can hardly believe it's her. 
Uh, the person they remembered is gone. She's got no more pleasantness in her heart. She's filled with bitterness, and she attempts to take a new name to herself. She says, call me Mara, in verse 20. For the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. She blamed God for her affliction, and she was prepared to settle in her discontent. And it does bring up a good question. She said, the Lord has afflicted me. The Lord dealt bitterly with me. Could God have stopped the death of her husband and her sons? Yes. Why didn't he? We can't say. Now, knowing the rest of the story, we know how God used this tragedy in Naomi's life, and he brought forth David. Eventually, he brings forth the Lord Jesus. What starts off in tremendous bitterness ends in great glory. Yet at the time, in that hour, at that moment for Naomi, she had no way of knowing any of this, and all she experiences is mournful, bitter sadness. Guys, this is one area where faith becomes so very important. We don't know why God allows certain things, stops other things. We do know that God is sovereign. Whatever God wants to do, He's going to see done. Sometimes that matches up with our desires. Other times it doesn't. What do we do with it all? That's where we have to trust. That's where we have to faith. Trust that God knows us. Trust that God loves us. Trust that God is indeed powerful enough to take all things and use them for His good and for His glory. It's far better to trust God with unanswered questions than it is to grow bitter and angry at Him for not answering them the way that we want Him to. Just trust the Lord. Well, things are going to change a little bit for her. Hope is going to start to be restored in chapter 2. And first, we have the Redeemer enter in, verses 1 through 18. So another character is introduced here. His name is Boaz. Now, it's uncertain what his name means. It likely has something to do with strength. One of the pillars of Solomon's temple was later named Boaz. Who was Boaz? Well, he himself, he was a strong pillar, a great man. Uh, Look at chapter 2, verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. He was not an immediate brother of Elimelech, which would definitely followed under the Leverett Laws. He was a family member of some sort. He was a family member with great wealth. So that's quite the contrast to these two widow women, right? They're destitute. They're even unable to use the former lands of her husband. They'd be living off the barest resources. They would be living off the mercies of others. Boaz, on the other hand, he's a wealthy, well-respected member of the community with fields and servants in abundance. If anyone could help these two women, Boaz could, right? Coming in and, hey... Bill Gates is part of the family. Let's talk. Something similar. In order to eat, Ruth and Naomi would have to glean from the fields. Uh, This was basically the ancient Hebrew form of food stamps, and we read this in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, that tells us about it. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape from your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So the landowner would harvest the field, certainly, but he wasn't to do so careful of a job that he didn't leave anything behind. Some of it was to be left behind purposely for the poor to come, for them to be able to get food for themselves. And by the way, there's a very interesting difference here between the biblical practice of gleaning and many modern ideas that concern welfare. The landowners weren't commanded to pick the fields for the poor. They were just commanded to leave some fruit and grain behind. The poor had the responsibility to come in and pick their own food for themselves. Benevolence never absolves anyone of personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is uplifted throughout all the scriptures, no matter what testament we're looking at. But this is the practice that Ruth was to engage in if she and Naomi were going to eat, presuming that Naomi wasn't able to go out and do it for herself. And so she asks Naomi for permission to go, and Naomi gives it to her. And although Ruth has no idea, she was guided by God to a very specific field to glean, and that was the field of Boaz. Now, just in this, we see the supernatural sovereign hand of God. Because Ruth is a stranger to the town. She's a virtual stranger to Naomi's family. She didn't have a clue whom was related to whom. She's a foreigner. All she knew is that she needed to work to bring home some food for her and Naomi to eat that night. This is the way she was allowed to do it. So she was, what, faithful with what she knew to do, and then God did the rest. 
God took her to precisely the right field at the right time in the right way to ensure that her provision was cared for not just that night, but for the rest of her life. And again, we may not understand everything that God's doing in our life, but we can be faithful with the things that we have right in front of us. Be faithful with what you know. Leave the rest to God. He's more than capable of working things out for his glory. The long and the short of it is that Boaz sees Ruth in the field, learns who she is from the servants, commands his servants to both protect her and to provide for her. He ensures that no one's going to bother her while she's working, gives her the freedom to drink water that his servants have already drawn from the well. Why did he do it? Because he knew of the compassion and the commitment that Ruth had shown Naomi, and he understood how God was glorified in it all. Look, if you would, at Ruth chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says there, and Boaz answered and said to her, it has been fully reported to me all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you've left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Ruth had come to faith in God and had come under the protection of God. This Moabitess acted more like a true Hebrew than many others did in Israel, and that was something Boaz just understood was worthy of praise. People are going to take notice of the way we deal with tragedy. They'll take notice of a lot of things, but specifically the way we deal with tragedy. Some of the greatest witnessing in your life might be done when you haven't spoken a word, because that's when our faith is put into action, and that speaks volumes, and they'll see it when we put it in action and when we don't as well. In addition to Everything else Boaz had already provided for Ruth, he invited her to dinner, had her take home the leftovers, commanded his servants to leave even more barley behind, specifically so that she would gather it up. He was abundantly generous with her overflowing with grace and mercy. Great picture of God's overflowing mercy and grace for us. And then as the chapter closes out, they recognize the hand of God, and at all, Ruth gets home that night. Naomi sees what happens. It says that she had several ephahs that she brought back. If you do the conversions, it's about 26 quarts of barley grain. That's a lot. Not to mention the dinner leftovers that she brought home, too. Far more than what you'd expect from just a normal day of gleaning, right? She quizzes Ruth, uh, Naomi does, on where she went that day. And upon learning that it was Boaz, she just erupts into praise. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. The Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. Quite a contrast to Naomi's earlier expression of bitterness, isn't it? She had felt afflicted by the Lord before, but now she realized that God had not forgotten it at all. God had been providing a way she could not have imagined, and she couldn't help but give praise to God. We can't see everything that God is doing, but we can always trust that He is working. We need to trust Him in the midst of whatever those circumstances are, and when you do, we might find that we can praise Him for the provision we haven't yet seen. She could. Notice that Naomi recognized Boaz as a relation, a close relative. Already she's seeing the provision that God, that, you know, Ruth may not be putting together yet. Naomi's looking beyond these 26 quarts of grain to the possibility of levered marriage, redemption. She sees the potential of a redeemer on the horizon, and so her hope is born once more. And so Naomi tells Ruth to stay in the fields of Boaz throughout the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and see what's going to happen. And that's where we pick up in chapter 3. Redemption is promised, and first thing we see is mother-in-law getting involved. It's the matchmaker. Verses 1 through 5, times passed, barley seasons come to an end. The winnowing now has begun. The winnowing is when the grain is separated from the chaff, so there's not going to be any more gleaning in a while because that harvest period is done. Naomi thinks, well, the time's right to take the next step. Now, due to their closeness with the harvest, Naomi knows when it's Boaz's turn to uh, guard the winnowed barley, they would stay in the Uh, the hut or wherever they had it overnight to keep the animals away from the stuff that's already been uh, winnowed out. And so Naomi hatches a plan. She tells Ruth to get cleaned up, get, uh, you know, perfumed up, dressed up, and go to Boaz after he settled, settled down after dinner, and he would take things from there. 
Now, when we read through it, the practice seems really pretty unusual to our ears, but this is really a very acceptable way for Ruth to present herself to Boaz as being available for marriage. And she's dressed differently, so she's no longer in the garments of mourning. She presents herself to Boaz at his feet, a sign that she wanted to come under his protection. Uh, some have tried to imagine something unsavory here, but everything that's here is culturally considered very chaste and honorable. And that's what she tells her to do, and that's what she does. And in verse 16 through 15, we find that Boaz discovers Ruth. She's there exactly according to Naomi's instructions, and he understands completely what it is Ruth is asking him to do. And he has a desire. He wants to be that kinsman redeemer for him. He wants to complete that act of levered marriage, but he also knows things need to be done in the proper fashion. There was another relative that was closer to Imelech, to Elimelech in relation than Boaz was, and that other relative needed first to be given the opportunity. But Boaz swore to see Ruth redeemed in marriage one way or the other, either through that relative or himself, she was going to be married. He once more gives her a gift of food. Some estimate this is up to 80 pounds worth of barley, a lot of food. And it's a sign of his commitment to her, both to provide for her and for her mother-in-law, and he sends her home in secret in order that the other relative could be approached without any bias or rumors or anything else going around. And so Naomi sees this, and she has faith in the promise. Naomi sees this gift of food, and she knows the matter is going to be settled. She has faith that Boaz is going to be true to his word. Look at verse 18 of chapter 3. Then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. What's so wonderful about this statement is how it parallels the work of our Savior, right? Though Ruth was not yet redeemed, she could rest in peace as though she already were. Boaz would see the work done before the end of the day. The work for our redemption, of course, has already been accomplished. That work was finished the moment Jesus took his last breath on the cross. It was confirmed the moment he rose from the grave. We've placed our faith and trust in Christ. We're saved. But what happens? Well, we still live here. We still struggle with our flesh. We still struggle with temptation. We still have trials. We still have hardship. Now we know by faith that you know we'll be with Jesus one day. We'll be delivered from these trials of this life. What do we do in the meantime? We rest. Though we're not yet physically with Jesus, we can rest in His grace as though we already are. God will complete the work that he has begun within us. Philippians 1.6 We never need doubt the final outcome of our faith. God is good to his word. and He's going to see the matter through. Chapter 4, we see this redemption finally accomplished and is done first in public. Another character is introduced, but notice he has no name. He's referred to as a close relative. Boaz calls him friend. It's striking that for all the other names in the book, the, this one important character is anonymous. Friend could be translated so-and-so or such-and-such. There seems to be a deliberate attempt from the author not to name him. His name is not worthy to be mentioned. And it's interesting that the, the name and inheritance of Elimelech, Boaz, Ruth, Naomi, that would live on through the single act of redemption, but the man who refused to follow the Lord's direction, his name is lost from history, right? Boaz approached this man publicly, did it so respectfully. In front of the elders, Boaz presented the case for Elimelech's inheritance to be redeemed. So Mr. So-and-so is there, and he's interested in acquiring the land, but not so much interested in acquiring another wife and an additional mother-in-law. He's unwilling to follow through on the duties of levered marriage, publicly waves his right, hands it over to Boaz, Boaz then makes this redic- uh, redemption transaction in full view of all the townspeople, commits himself to perpetuating the inheritance in the name of Elimelech, according to the law, takes Ruth as his own wife. What's the response of the people? Joy, blessing. Their wish for Boaz and for Ruth to be prosperous and numerous like Rachel and Leah, bringing forth the children of Israel. It's an act worthy of giving praise to God. That's what people did. That's exactly what our actions ought to cause people to do, right? Our lights are supposed to so shine before men that they what? See our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. That's what happened here. Let all that we do be done for the glory of God. So from this, hope is, of course, 
fully restored. We saw it a little bit earlier. Hope had been reborn as a glimmer for Naomi. Now it comes into full bloom. When Naomi first returned from Bethlehem, remember she had taken this name Mara, bitterness to herself. That's what she told the woman to call her because God had afflicted her. Now everything changed. And those same women that she said, call me Mara, they recognize the change God has brought in her life. Look at verse 14 and 15 of chapter four. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Had God afflicted Naomi? No. To be sure, he allowed her to go through tragic heartache, but God had not abandoned her. God had provided a redeemer for Naomi. And God's hand had been in this since Naomi first acquired Ruth as a daughter-in-law through her deceased son. If it had not been for Ruth, there would have been no hope for Naomi. God had laid the seeds for Naomi's redemption long before Naomi could have ever fathomed there would be a need for her to be redeemed. When did God lay the seeds for our redemption? Long before we can imagine. We quoted 1 Peter in regards to our redemption earlier. And we read it, right? 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. And that's wonderful. It speaks of the redemption of Christ. But obviously the text doesn't end there. What does it go on to say? Well, it says this in verse 20 and 21. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him up from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The seeds for our redemption were placed before the foundation of the world. Think of it this way. Before Adam sinned, Jesus saved. Before the sin of Adam created a need for redemption, the redemptive work of Christ was already being planned out by God. It was finally revealed when Jesus went to the cross, but it had been the plan of God all along. He was slain from before the foundation of the earth. God's plan was always to extend his salvation to you and to me that we might be redeemed to his own glory. That's the sovereign work of God. Bit of appendix here at the end with the genealogy of the king. This really seems to have been the primary purpose of the book in the first place. Whoever the writer was, he desired to give an account of David's genealogy, which turns to show that an act of redemption wasn't just given for Naomi and Ruth, but really the seeds were laid for a greater redemption for the nation of Israel. Because no longer would there be the days of the judges and everyone did what was right in his own eyes, but there would be a king, a glorious king, one that would follow after all God's own heart. Of course, ultimately, this leads to a far better Redeemer, the greater than Boaz, the greater than David, the Lord Jesus Christ. He redeemed us not just from hopelessness, but from death itself. We had nothing without Christ, but now we have everything in Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1.3, and we have an eternal spiritual inheritance in Him, and all of it comes through His sacrificial love. It comes through His all-sufficient redemption. We can praise God for... Ruth's loving commitment, her sacrifice, Naomi. We can praise God for Boaz's loving commitment, his sacrifice for Ruth. But most of all, we can praise God for Jesus's loving commitment and sacrifice for us. He's redeemed us from the grave. And talking about giving praise to God, there's not enough to give in return. So we need to ask ourselves if we're resting in his grace, if we're trusting in his sovereignty. He is totally in control. and He's going to see us through to the end until the very moment that we finally understand the fullness of our redemption. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for the redemption we have in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the picture that was painted for this through the book of Ruth. But, Lord, it's not just a story. It's the truth. It's history. You interacted in her life and Naomi's life to bring them to a place of redemption and that you would get all the glory. And Lord, you act in our lives in such a way where you need to get all the glory as well. So help our eyes be open to those things that you are doing. Help us trust you at all times. Help us rest in the fullness of the work that Jesus has done in us. Resting as if we're already in the presence of God right now and 
many ways we are, seated in the heavenly places right now. Lord, we thank you. We can't wait to see you face to face. Help us trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.